We often hear that it's very important to have control in sparring and fencing in general. But what even is it? And perhaps more importantly, how do we get it? That will be the topic for today's video, so let's roll the intro. Hello there, it's Oscar at Virtual Factula. Today's topic is quite close to my heart and it already came up quite a bit in the previous video. So this is quite a natural continuation. For this video, I'll first be re recapping why I think it's important to pay attention to control with sparring and then I'll show you how in very general terms I approach the subject. And finally, at the end of the video, I'll be sharing with you a bit of advice that really changed the way I approach training fencing. Although I talked about this at length two weeks ago, a bit of a recap is of course never a bad idea. In my opinion, control is the ability to leverage your speed and power to dictate what's happening in a fencing exchange, as well as dialing in just exactly how hard you're going to hit. In 15th and 16th century fight books, both these aspects of control are of vital importance. First off, in order to control a fight, in German fight books, you really need to understand the five words vor, nach, indes, stärk and schwach. Understanding these and using them as a sort of more instrument to determine what is going on in a particular fencing exchange will allow you to then pick the appropriate option and in theory at least control the fight. And of course when it comes to trauma um, it's very important to be able to distinguish between techniques that are really meant to hurt someone, those techniques that are meant to amuse or send a message and of course there's also these techniques where all of that is entirely dependent on your decision on how hard and where you would like to hit. In a modern setting control gives us two things generally speaking. First it allows us to keep our sparring partner safe which is of course very important. And secondly, it allows us to use a wide variety of partially foreseen actions, or fencing with eyes open, if you will. It requires a couple of things to learn. First off, it requires you to understand initiative. And of course, you should also be nurturing the mind-muscle connections and the muscle memory associated with these partially foreseen actions. And last but not least, it requires quite a bit of courage and faith in your weapon. So, let's break these down, shall we? Initiative is often understood to be just about timing. And sure enough, attacking Vor is obviously better than defending Nach. But at the same time, leverage is just as important. Because whomever can control the opponent's weak by using their strong Indes can really control an action. And therefore, both Vor, Nach, Stärk, Schwach and Indes are very important to determine who has initiative. The worst injuries and the stupidest doubles occur when either one of the fighters or both fighters have absolutely no clue who has the initiative at any given point. And on the other hand, the most beautiful fights to watch are between those fencers who have this very implicit understanding of who has initiative. Thankfully, it's not difficult to learn the skill, but you need to invest enough time in it. And that's the honest truth of it. It takes time. You can, for instance, take drills with very clear parameters and boundaries that will exclusively focus on discerning the right moment to take back initiative. Or, on the other hand, you could use some drills where you use Zufechten uh, to create a setup where you really limit your partner's options for responding to that, meaning that you have less different options to worry about, meaning that you can make a proper decision quicker. The Sprechfenster, as described by Jude Lev in his one sort section, is a very nice example of it and one that can be found spread out over several places in Lekuchner's manuscript as well for Messer. Now, keep in mind this is always going to take work, but if you're willing to put the hours in, it's definitely going to be paying its dividends in your sparring. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that this is my preferred way of doing it, but there's more than one way to skin a cat. Yeah, wait until they hear about Katzbagers. So, Muscle memory and mind-muscle connections. Prepare to get sciency. Mind-muscle connections has been a very popular idea in the fitness world recently. And it has to do with the idea that you can use the existing muscle fibers that you have to greater effect with greater efficiency. And it does so by trying to strengthen the neurological bond between your brain and the muscles in question. It effectively improves your power to weight ratio. And that's of course very useful to us fences as well. Now, 
it's very difficult to try and cut through the heaps of information on the internet, but this is kind of what I found to be relevant to us. I personally found that becoming very conscious of all the muscles involved in, to, in performing a certain technique can be very beneficial because it, uh, doing that will actually then allow me to use the full activation of all these muscles and therefore really improve the structure of a given technique, which improves its effectiveness obviously. Now, it can be a good idea to first try and activate all these muscles without a weapon to make it a bit easier for our minds to process that and then put the weapon in our hand later on. This can be very beneficial, maybe not everywhere, but I personally found that this works really well. Muscle memory refers to repeatedly performing an action so that the conscious effort required to perform that action becomes less and less over time spent practicing. Now, this is of course very important for partially foreseen actions because we need really good muscle memory on those actions specifically to be able to pull them off with eyes open. Generally speaking, this means you should first train a technique in isolation, solo or with a partner, just that technique. Then in a variable environment with, for instance, a choice drill. And then finally, a graduate towards doing it in free play. Ultimately, to be able to fence with eyes open requires to have a very strong connection between your brain and the muscles that need to perform that action. And in order to get that, you need loads of repetition and a very much conscious effort put into activ activating the right muscle grips. Finally, the element of courage. Erschickst du gern kein Fechten nimmer gelernt. Or, as I like to put it, if you're overly tense, best not learn to fence. If you want to learn to fence with any sort of weapon, uh, generally speaking, you have to try and change or even completely unlearn some of the natural responses that we humans have to violence. Let me say this clearly. There is absolutely no shame in struggling with this because this is not easy. There will be points in your practice, be that in drills, in free play or in tournaments, where at some point you're just going to, your instinctive reactions are just going to override everything that you have learned. This is a bit of a problem though, because sometimes these unforeseen actions are perfectly appropriate to the situations, but more often than not, they will do, do have you do things that are not optimal in that situation for keeping you safe. And at times they might even put the safety of your partner at risk because generally the power output of these actions is tremendously high. A good coach can help you identify at which point you are no longer in control and then how it shows. And once you know what's up, you then have roughly two options to help you deal with it. One is to expose yourself gradually to more speed and intensity uh, and get used to it so that you'll ultimately allow yourself to be in control at higher speeds and intensities, just by exposing yourself to high speed fencing more often. The second thing you can do is try and tweak your natural responses to kind of coincide with good fencing actions. Again, this requires lots of repetition and slowly upping the intensity. The most common responses that you really might want to tweak are, for instance, attacking into an opponent's attack, which leads to a lot of doubles, uh, running backwards, which might keep you safe, but also stops you from actively controlling the fight, and twitching, which tends to break your structure to the point that you really can't perform good techniques anymore. Now, once you figure this out with your coach, you can try building drills that will expose you to the situation where you have these, these instinctive actions and then specifically focus on trying to tweak them into something that will actually work. Now, using these drills will you then allow you to defend, stand and actually fight. And that will allow you to experience this elusive thing that I keep referring to as control. And now, here's the big one. This is really the most important lesson about fencing that I've ever learned. And it is crucial for making all of the above work. It's to take it slow. Sure, if you can do it slow, doesn't necessarily mean you can do it fast. But if you can't even do it slow, you're sure as heck not going to be able to do it fast. Not good at any rate. This goes for any sort of training, but especially so for free play. Slow sparring can be a very nice bridge between doing stuff in drills and doing it in full speed sparring. Because you will still have all the unpredictability and variables of sparring, but at the same time the speed will be relatively slow. If you're having trouble making the thing that you're practicing work in slow sparring, slow it the heck down. Give yourself time to understand what's happening. Give yourself time to nurture mind muscle connections and muscle memory for this action and give yourself time to not do anything weird that will ruin the thing you're working on. And if you do this and it all comes together nicely, it's going well, then you speed up. 
rinse, repeat, be awesome. Now, as usual, making these videos on YouTube is made possible by people actually going and watching them. And if you feel you got some value out of it, please let me know by leaving a like or leaving a comment. Feel free to engage. I really appreciate it and it helps the channel. It was also made possible by my generous patrons over at Patreon, of course. I like to think I make these videos uh, just because I can and because I like to give something back to the community, but with their very tangible support, it does become a lot easier. So anyway, I hope to see you all for the next video. And until then, I say, okay, do we?